Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Those of you that missed the first part, um, the, the class materials will give you a good idea of uh, what we covered. And then, of course, you can always watch the video later. So for those of you that uh, are joining us new tonight, now I'm Kathy Reimer, as Drew mentioned. Let's see if we can get the, here we go. If it, so we had the sound check, so we're good to go there. And I, uh, I am a master gardener with the U of A Cooperative Extension Office, University of Arizona. I'm also an Arizona native. I don't know how many natives uh, are out there, but uh, there's not many of us. My, my family actually grew up on a citrus and cotton ranch near 3rd Street and Baseline. That's where my mother was born. And uh, it's interesting because my husband's family is also native to the state. And his grandfather was the first auctioneer in Pinal County down in the Casa Grande area. So we have kind of a web deep roots here in the state. And I'm happy to be able to present this class to you tonight. So just give you um, a little introduction. I, I went to the University of Arizona. Wrong. I went to get those mixed up. I went to the I went to Arizona State University and graduated with a degree in um, in education, specializing in biology. And then I then, when then I went to work for the University of Arizona. And so I get teased a lot about having um, you know, loyalties to the Tucson Wildcats, but uh, but I I like both of them. I <clears throat> I'm lucky enough to have raised two daughters here, and uh, and now have some grandchildren. So. That's pretty exciting. So let's get on with the presentation tonight. As soon as we get the computer going here, here we go. All right, so here's your class materials. It includes a resources list, and this you can keep on hand for later reference. It'll give you some handy websites, lots of information from the University of Arizona, which I like to recommend because they're uh, research based, they're non biased, they're not trying to sell you something, and, um, and the information is being updated on a regular basis. There's also a little publication uh, that I put together on drip irrigation for vegetables uh, and annual flowers. It just talks about the equipment that you'll need, um, you know, what, to, what to look for, how to lay it out. We discussed this at the, the last class. But uh, whether or not you have a drip system that's controlled by your irrigation controller electronically, or if you're doing it by hand, either way works fine, but this will kind of lay it out for you. A little publication on growing tomatoes. This was done by a master gardener with the University of Arizona, and it's pretty descriptive as far as how to be able to grow tomatoes successfully here. Not too long, but a little good information. Then there's a little chart that shows you what to plant when. So those are your warm season vegetables. On the flip side is, are the cool season vegetables. There's a few herbs thrown in there as well. And speaking of herbs, there's also a little a bulletin on growing herbs. Now this one is a little old. It's put up by the university, but it's a little old, so it's not in publication anymore, but it still has some great information. Now, many of you, especially if you have a, a small space, you might want to do some container gardening. And this works really well. I just I wanted to point this out because at the last class, we talked about the, the recipe, the mixture for gardening in the ground. Container gardening is totally different when it comes to the, the contents of the, the potting mixture that you're going to use. And there are some other differences as well. But try and use the largest capacity container you can manage. Um, those little wheelie the, the dollies with wheels on them are handy for moving containers around because they do get pretty heavy once you get them filled with soil. And if they're made of clay or wood or even the insulated plastic, the, those work really well. The I kind of like the insulated plastic because they're not as heavy. And um, when you're working with a large size, then that works pretty good. You can kind of tell if you if you feel them, they won't just be like a single layer. They'll be sort of thick, almost like a foam base. And the soil mix, this is key. 
four containers. So you'll want to use one third potting soil, one third peat, mo peat moss or compost, and one third pumice. Now you can also substitute vermiculite or perlite for the pumice if you can't find it. Most nurseries should handle it. But this is a, a great mixture for your containers. It'll help retain moisture, but it will also drain the excess water off. Some people like to take one container and put it inside a container that's a little larger. In other words, you kind of like you know, stack them like you would bowls in, in your cupboard. And if there's a little space in between, you can take styrofoam, those styrofoam packing peanuts work really well. Or even um, if you don't have styrofoam, you can use like um, watered up newspaper and stuff it down in between the two containers. And that will give you a little bit of insulation. Because in the summertime, you know, our a container is not like a garden in the ground because in a container, it's exposed to basically all four sides. And so if the temperature outside is going to be, you know, 110 or higher, then that your soil temperature warms up pretty darn quickly. So any insulation you can give it is really handy. In a container, also because you're not gardening in the ground, you'll find that it's necessary to fertilize more often. A, an easy method or an easy product to use is the pelletized slow release fertilizer and you add a little bit when at planting time you can put some down you know underneath the uh, the plant or the area where you're going to push your, your plant or you can sprinkle it on top of the soil and then water it in as you do your applications and as soon, when the water of course touches it it dissolves just a little bit releasing the fertilizer into the soil and this will last, you know, nine months, maybe a little bit longer, nine months to a year. So you don't have to worry about, you know, mixing fertilizers to put on your potted plants. You just use a slow release that kind of does it for you. Of course, you can mix your own fertilizers. Some are come, you know, pre-mixed. However you want to do it is fine. Just remember that you, you'll have to do it a little more often if you're not using the slow release. Don't let your container sit in water or sit directly like on the concrete or in a saucer. Try and raise them up with uh, mimic little container feet or you can, you can use pieces of, I have at home, I have some pieces of flagstone, really small pieces that I just put under the container so that it allows the water to drain out, the excess water to drain out. In, with containers, the plants will, are going to need the sun, but they don't necessarily need the heat. So. If you have them on those little dollies with uh, wheels, you can rotate them around or move them in to a more shady area if they need it when the weather gets really hot or vice versa. In the winter time, you can move them out where they're gonna get more sun. When it comes to watering in the containers, you're going to water more often. The schedule is going to vary with the seasons or it just makes sense. You know, in the summer, you'll need to water more often in the winter, not as, as much. And you can use a, a watering wand. Those are pretty handy. You just screw them onto the end of your hose and gives you, you know, a little more length where you can reach over or down and don't have to bend over to water your containers. If you're not sure, you know, how much water your container needs, you can purchase a little soil moisture meter. And you know, stick that down in, and it'll tell you, you know, how dry or how wet the soil is, and whether or not it's time to apply more water. Sometimes, you know, the old finger trick works too. You can put your finger in to check it, but those moisture meters are pretty handy too. As long as the water, as some of the water, is coming out of the bottom of your container, then that's good. You don't want it all to come out, of course, but um, if a little water drains out, that's fine. That actually helps flush some of the salts out. Our water here is a little salty, so when you apply it to a container soil, then um, as it moistens the soil, the excess drains out, that will carry some of those excess salts with it. And your containers can be attached to your drip system if, if, you, have, if you can configure it that way. 
sometimes it requires a separate valve for container plants because as I mentioned, they need to be watered more often than your plants that are in the ground. But it is possible. So you might want to look into that, see if it would work for you. It's important to choose plants carefully because of course those that are adapted to our soil and climate are going to need less water. Because they're better adapted, they're going to be healthier. And because they're healthier, they're not going to be bothered by as many pests or um, other you know, problems. So you that re won't require as much pesticide or perhaps insecticide to uh, control those things. When you're planting, you can use seeds or you can purchase little transplants, which however you want to do it is fine. Just remember that with very young plants, sometimes the birds find that this is like, you know, the salad bar that you've given them and you may have to protect them. One way, easy way to do it is to do, just use the fabric row covers. Sometimes they call it, I'll call it floating row cover. And it's similar to the product they use in winter for frost protection, but this time of year they uh, they make a, uh, have a, a lighter density, it's a, a lighter weave than the frost protection fabric. So look for that and you can cover your new seedlings or even your new transplants. If it's the, if it's the birds that you're concerned about, you can also use bird netting or you can use it instead. Don't plant everything at once. I know it's, it's kind of, you, know, you get your garden ready and you want to get every, everything done. But what happens is if you plant it all at once, it has a tendency to get ripe or where it's ready all at once. And then you're sort of stuck with all these things that you can't eat fast enough and you may have to give some to your neighbors. So if you can you know, plant, plant successively, maybe every couple of weeks, plant some new things, um, that will give you a longer harvest and you won't be, won't have that uh, big abundance of, of food or, or you know, vegetables or fruits to have to deal with. So here's some ideas to protect the plants uh, from birds, especially in the upper left is bird netting. Underneath that is also some netting. It's a finer mesh. It's hard to tell from this photo, but you can kind of tell it's, it's green and they've just stretched it over their entire garden area. And then on the right, they actually use some mosquito netting for their protection, their plant protection. Keep in mind though, that plants that need to be pollinated by insects are not gonna be able to get into something that's more solid like this mosquito netting or even the uh, row cover material. It's okay maybe to use in the beginning when they're young to protect them, but once they start blooming, you may have to remove it so that the pollinators can do all that great work that they do. Another trick is to just use this fabric, and they call it tule, and it's the stuff that they make wedding bales out of, and you can use that over your plants to protect them as well. And it, I'm not sure what this costs, but it may be less expensive than buying the row covers. Here's a picture of my garden. And uh, I showed this last night at, to the class, but this is kind of a, a view of the entire thing. We started out just with the short little plastic fencing. And then I found that the birds were getting in there and you know, helping themselves to a lot of things that I had planted. And so my husband helped, well, he did most of the work, but uh, he put up two by fours and then attached to the two by fours, he, he used um, a conduit pipe. And then we stretched bird netting over the top of the entire garden. And that helped a lot. It saved me from having to bend over and lift up all the row covers. Excuse me, just a second. <coughs> and, um, I could, I could put the bird netting on, I could even put shade cloth up over the top of the structure as well. 
So just a few planting tips. When you're planting with seeds, think about how deep they need to be in the soil. Uh, the rule of thumb is two or three times the size of the seed. So if you're planting a bean, those are probably you know less than half an inch. So they need to be planted, you know, an inch, inch and a half deep in the soil. If you're using something like carrot seeds, they're very, very small. They only need to be planted maybe a quarter of an inch under the soil. If you're using transplants, once you get them out of their little containers, uh, try and massage the roots a little bit and loosen them so that when you plant them, the roots can establish and grow into the surrounding soil a little more quickly. Try and get those nasty weeds out of there when they're small because they do uh, use the water and the nutrients that your garden plants are going to need. By using mulches, and we talked a lot about this last night, mulches around your plants, once you get them planted, once your little seedlings have emerged and they're up you know, a little bit, you can put mulch over the top of the soil around them and that will help keep the weeds out and it'll also slow the evaporation rate so you don't have to water as often. It keeps the soil cooler, especially in the summertime. And that's a big benefit for plants. Try not to over fertilize. And we have a tendency to think, well, if a little bit's good and a lot is maybe better, but that's not really the case. So just add a little fertilizer um, and wait. If you think you need more, you know, give it a couple of weeks and then add a, a little tiny bit more and see if that works. But don't run on too much at once because you can actually um, what they call burn, the tender roots of seedlings and those young transplants. Fertilizer act, uh, fertilizers are actually salts. We have magnesium, we have um, phosphorus, and those are types of salts, and they can burn the roots in large, when they're applied in large quantities. To help you remember where you planted things, you can use labels and they can be simple like these little uh, wooden ones. Or you can get a little more creative. You can also use foil and attach them to even things like, you know, plastic spoon or fork stems and uh, put those in your garden. And speaking of spoons, here's a clever way of using, uh, you know, old spoons that you don't use, or you, know, you could even do it to plastic spoons. Once you have your, your garden in and you started harvesting things, a lot of us are tempted to start saving the seeds, especially like, let's say you, you had a watermelon. It was just fabulous, you know, the taste was so sweet. Oh, juicy. And you wanna save the seeds to plant for next year. Well, what happens is they, the watermelon itself, the flesh is great, but the seed inside may not be the genetic material that you want or that you're tasting in the flesh. And of course, that's because of hybridization from pollinization. So plants that have these big open flowers, like the squashes, even like the watermelon, they're, plant, they're pollinated by insects. There's a lot of cross-pollination going on. And there could be, let's say you've got melons in one part of your garden and you've got zucchini in one part of your garden. They can actually cross-pollinate. So the seed of that tasty watermelon could be part watermelon and part zucchini. So you have to kind of be careful when it comes to saving seeds. On the other hand, some flowers are what they call self-pollinated. So they don't need another pollinator. This is a, in the lower right, and this is a tomato flower. And the, uh, the center of it is very close. So it's very difficult for insects to get in and bring the pollen of another plant to this particular flower. I'm going to give you an overview of edibles and we're going to start with vegetables and then a little on herbs and then some on the tree crops. And then there are a few edible landscape plants that you uh, might even have growing in your yard right now and you didn't even realize it. So let's start with 
vegetables. But first I have to ask you, what's the difference between a fruit and a vegetable? So what's a fruit? A lot of us think of things like strawberries or peaches or even like that watermelon I mentioned. But what about this? This is an eggplant in the image. What is that eggplant? Is that a fruit? Well, if it's not a fruit, then it must be a vegetable, right? So what's a vegetable? How do we differentiate? I think most people, when you talk about vegetables, they think of things like, oh, you know, lettuce and zucchini, beans. But from a botanical perspective, the definition of a fruit is something with seeds inside. So those of you that have eaten eggplant before, if you chop this eggplant in half, what would you find? Yeah, you find seeds. Same way with a zucchini. When you cut a zucchini open in the middle, you've got seeds, right? So botanically, a zucchini, an eggplant, tomato, um, even that watermelon, those are fruits. And everything else is a vegetable, pretty much. So onions, lettuce, things like that. Okay, this is just a brain teaser. You can you know, challenge your friends to answer this question too. So a fruit is, botanically speaking, it's a ripened ovary with seeds inside. So if you've got something in your refrigerator or your garden with seeds inside, it is a fruit. Now there's exceptions to the rule, like strawberries, they have their seeds on the outside, but most everything, most all fruits have seeds inside. So you chop a carrot in half, no seeds, right? It's a vegetable. Okay, we've spent enough time on that. So what do you want to grow in your garden? Most people want to plant what their family likes, right? So make a list, you know, decide what you want to grow. Select a location, which we talked about last time. And remember, for those of you that are joining, just joining us tonight, don't feel like you have to create this huge garden. It's important to be successful and if you take on too big of a task, you may get very discouraged. So plan big, you can plan a big area for a garden, but maybe just choose a small portion of it to get started. And then once you kind of you know, get a little experience under your belt, then you can enlarge as you know, the seasons go by. There are different growing seasons, and we're gonna look at these in just a moment. And, um, on a lot of the publications that you, references that you look at, you'll see, you know, how long it takes for a particular garden plant or, or vegetable or fruit to harvest. What's that time? Is it 60 days? Is it 150 days? So there's different times. And that might determine when you plant things. And then as always, try and be water wise with your garden. Use a drip system. Don't spray with a hose or with a sprinkler. Use mulches because that slows evaporation and saves water. Then the drip system puts the water right where the roots are. There are different growing seasons for vegetables here. Now, uh, for those of you that haven't been in uh, the Arizona desert very long, excuse me, <coughs> This is going to be completely backwards from what you've learned if you've gardened other places. So for us, our cool season, our cool season vegetables, so we start planting those in October. And we can we can plant them, you know, through February, but generally with October, October, November, maybe early December, and then things start ripening <clears throat> a few months later. The warm season, that's where we are right now. So it runs generally from February through June. <clears throat> and then we have a third season, the hot season, from June through September. 
Now there are some brave gardeners that are out there during uh, you know these months, June to September. And some of the things that you plant now, you may still be able to harvest it during this time as well. But for me to be out there, you know, digging in my garden, you know, working, what I would call working in my garden in June and July and August is, uh, is something I, I really try to avoid. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't mind going out there harvesting things, but trying to do work, it's, uh, it's just, a, it's awful darn hot. So if you're brave, you can try it, but, uh, just remember that there are some things that you can still grow even during those months. Okay, now, so for fall planting, this side, for me, I think this is the premium time to garden. We have, our, our winters are generally pretty mild. We don't get too many freezing nights. And this is, uh, I mean, you can have just a, a really bounty by planting in the fall. <clears throat> Pardon me, I have a little, in my throat. So, of course, on the upper left, we've got carrots. At the bottom there, we have there's that spinach, uh, peas, all kinds of peas are wonderful to plant in the fall, radishes. The, the list is pretty long. There are also plants in this huge group called the brassicas. And this includes the, the cabbage, cauliflowers, mustards, um, things like bok choy, turnips. Uh, did I say broccoli? If I didn't, it's, uh, it's in this group. And these are plants that were grown by the Greeks and Romans. So they're, they're, out and they're bordering on ancient, I would say. And when the Crusaders moved north through Europe, they took them with them. So that's how the Europeans became exposed to this wonderful group of plants. When they're also referred to the cruciferies and when they bloom up on the upper right, their flowers have this sort of cross form to them. And so that's another way to identify plants in this group. <coughs> Also in the, in the fall, you can plant lettuce and there's all kinds of lettuce, you know, leaf lettuce, bib lettuce, iceberg, romaine, uh, other fat plants, uh, even arugula, which is actually more in that uh, brassica group. But um, these are a group that are, yeah, I guess you call them a group that you'd want to plant in succession because you don't want all your romaine lettuce to you know, become harvestable at the same time. So again, you know, plant in sort of you know two or three week periods so that everything doesn't become ready to pick at the same time. Some of the lettuces you know have different days to maturity, so depending on the type, some will be ready really fast and some might take a little bit longer. Generally, forty to eighty days is uh, is typical. I think I planted some red leaf lettuce about the first of December. I kind of got caught a little behind. But I'm, I'm, we've been picking it for a couple months now. Oh, these are just images of let, different kinds of lettuce. And then in the spring, <coughs> we can plant things like those that are pictured here. So we've got zucchini, of course, tomatoes, the melons, and beans. And these are perfect for spring planting. And it looks like we're going to have some decent weather, you know, 80s for the next couple of days, but then drops into the 70s for the next uh, 10 days or so. So this is a perfect time to get things in the ground. Tomatoes are great for spring planting in the fall. I know they, they have them in the fall at the nurseries, you know, and but but tomatoes, if we get a cold winter, it sometimes can be hard to keep them growing through that season. <clears throat> so spring is really great. You want to wait until the soil or air temperature is 65 degrees, so we're there. If you want to start seeds, you have to do those early, start them in January, and then set the little transplants out in March. In the desert, you want to look for tomatoes that ripen fast, because here we are, the 17th of March, and if you've got a tomato that takes 90 days to maturity, you know, it's going to be in June before you're ready to pick. So <clears throat> these 
varieties that are mentioned here, are, they're not all, but these are just some that you might take a look at. You know, early girl, she's about 50 days. Celebrity, I think, is been 54 or 60 days. Champion and heat wave. And then the cherry tomatoes, they actually don't mind the heat as much as a lot of the other tomato varieties. So look for the short or the early ripening tomato varieties. <clears throat> if you see some letters on the tomato label, and here it's for just for an example is VNTF, it, really, it indicates their resistance to a, a number of things like Brazilian wilt, uh, if there's root knot nematodes or fusarium wilt, or even tobacco mosaic virus. So that's what those little letters mean. Now with tomatoes, uh, there's some tricks that you can do when you plant them. If they're big enough when you buy them at the store, you can actually turn them on their side when you plant and then bury part of the stem. Because at each node, when you plant and bury them in the soil, it will develop roots. So you get a bigger root mass for this plant. And of course, the bigger roots, that means it's going to grow bigger, faster, and hopefully give you more fruit. Once they get pretty big, and you may have to stake them, or you can use the tomato cages, just some sort of support instead of letting them grow on the ground. There are some uh, critters that really like tomatoes, and so you may have to kind of you know, keep them up off the ground to prevent that. When the little flowers, the yellow flowers, when they open in the morning, one thing you can do is shape the stem of the tomato plant, or you can just kind of flick it with your finger and thumb, kind of flick the little flower, and it sure shakes up the pollen. Once the temperatures get to about 90 degrees, 90, 95 degrees, it actually can kill the pollen. So even though your tomatoes may still be flowering, they probably won't set any fruit when, they, when you get to those temperatures. <laughs> so by using shade cloth, you can reduce the temperature a little bit and keep them producing a little longer into the season. But you don't want to use anything more dense than 50%. So 50% shade cloth, and that will extend your harvest season a little bit longer. Now, if you, if you plant tomatoes now, they make it through the summer, and then you know, they, they, may, they will probably start producing again in the fall, the, uh, and if we hopefully won't have a, a frost, then you can have a nice harvest in the, in the fall as well. So a couple of tips about peppers. Um, here, the chili peppers do a little bit better than the bell peppers. Bell peppers are a little susceptible to scalding from the sun, and they're a little finicky about the soil temperature and the air temperature. So for the bell peppers, if you want to try those, be sure you've got your, your garden soil mixed with a lot of great organic material, like we discussed yesterday, and you'll probably have to put a shade cover over them a little earlier to keep the temperatures uh, a little cooler for them and also to keep that their skins from scalding in the sun. <clears throat> you can start these from seeds or from transplants. They tend to have deep roots, so be sure you have your soil tilled down to at least you know 12 inches in depth. And they like cool nights, so the, our temperatures right now are perfect for peppers. Onions are another one that, uh, I mean, these are popular to, uh, to grow in your garden. There's, there's the sweet onions, there's several varieties mentioned here. And the one trick with onions is to avoid using sulfur in your fertilizer. So instead of using something like, you know, ammonium sulfate, that's the sulfur compound, use something else. The sulfur makes them really hot. You know, when you cut an onion in half and it makes you cry? Yeah, that, the, the, the sulfur increases the cry factor. So uh, just, just think about that if you're going to be planting some onions. A lot of them, if you're, good at, if you're planting onions from seed, you need to start in the fall. But if you want to try and grow onions now, look for the little onion sets. They look like you know, little green onions just about. And you can put those out and uh, they should produce a harvest for you in May or June.
these are some onions. You may have to uh, do a little searching to find these, but these are Itoi onions. They're nearly native. No, they're not completely native. They were brought over by the um, Spanish missionaries back in the teens, 1600s. And they're really easy to grow. They, their taste is more like a shallot. It's not quite as, uh, as strong as a green onion. And you can use all parts of the plant. You can use the tops like chives. You can chop up the bottoms, you know, as like onions. They use less water and they multiply like crazy. From one little bulb, you can get, if you don't, assuming you don't dig it up or you know, eat it, <laughs> you can get a, a, at least a hundred plants during the next year. So um, keep that in mind. These are the Itoi onions. Here's a picture of how they, they kind of grow. And these are like one little onion will produce tons and tons of more little baby onions. If we ever have another live class again, and I'm sure we will, um, I'll, I'll bring some onions to share with you because they multiply so fast, you just can't use them all. And they, they, I, I dig them up and give them away to my friends. The native crops do really well here. Um, these, of course, are, are crops that were used by our, the Native Americans, like you know, corn, bean, and, beans, and squash. And lots of other crops. Native Seed Search is a company down in Tucson, and they have a catalog, an online catalog, <clears throat> or they have hard copy too, but you, know, you can search online. And they have all kinds of heirloom varieties of you know, chilies and peppers and melons and beans and corn. Just, it's just, you know, they have tons and tons of things. And these are all, um, you know, they're preserving the natural heritage of the Native American crops. And then, of course, you can take advantage of that by growing some in your own garden. This uh, website is on your reference handout. So the technique that the Native Americans used was to uh, create a mound of soil. And in the center of the mound, they planted corn. Now, this is great because I kept the corn stalks together and they could pollinate each other. But it also served as a support for beans. So around the corn, they planted beans. The beans could grow up the corn stalks. They used that for, for support. The beans, because they are a legume, they added nitrogen back into the soil, which was good for the other crops. And then around the base of the corn and the beans, they planted squash. The big leaves of the squash keep the soil cool. And uh, it's just, they called it the three sisters. So it's a great method for them. And it works for us too. When you're planting a garden, don't forget to use flowers. Um, not only are they pretty to look at, but they help draw in pollinators. And many of our crops need, you know, pollinization. So there's all kinds of flowers you can use. Some say they have uh, properties that help repel pests, like marigolds. And this is just another example. And another one. And here's just some ideas of flowers that you can use. So up in the top left, we have alyssum. Below that is lobelia, a little dianthus, or like baby carnations, and then of course marigolds. These don't be too big, and they add color, and like I say, they attract pollinators. Okay, now let's take a look at a few herbs. So from the top, well, these are all labeled, so you can see what they are. So the basil, cilantro, sage, dill, parsley. These can, these are great additions to your garden. Just remember that some don't take the heat, and some don't take the cold, like basil. So you can plant it now; it'd be great. But it doesn't like the cold. So if you plant it in the fall, just remember that if we get a frost, you'll probably lose it. Um, 
parsley and cilantro and dill, those are best grown in the fall. Um, sage, you can grow that pretty much year round. And tree crops. We can grow a lot of things here in our in our yards um, that produce fruit, edible fruit, you know, peaches, plums, of course, the citrus, lots of varieties of citrus. There are some apple varieties that do well in the desert. But let's take a look at citrus. There's tons, dozens of different citrus varieties, but all citrus is grafted. You have the above ground part, which is called the scion, and um, the below ground is the rootstock. So if you're going to plant a tree, you know, plant what you like to eat, you know, whether it's oranges or something more exotic, you know, like limes. Um, at the University of Arizona, the Cooperative Extension Office has a citrus clinic every January in Mesa at the Greenfield Citrus Nursery where you can go and taste test all different kinds of citrus. We're, I know we're past, we're past that right now, but um, if, you're, if you're thinking about planting a citrus tree and you want to taste the fruit first, that's a great place to go. But it's just they have some uh, educational little quick workshops too. If, you, if your space is limited, which a lot of us are, we have small places, small yards, look for a tree that's grafted onto flying dragon rootstock. So you have an orange, like maybe you have a needle orange and if it's grafted onto flying dragon rootstock, it stays small, the tree stays small. The fruit is normal size, but the tree stays small, about half the size of a regular variety citrus tree. So keep that name, I know it's kind of a silly name, flying dragon, but yeah, that keeps the trees uh, a dwarf size. So here's what a, the graft union looks like on a citrus tree. So I've got the arrow here. That's where this variety of citrus was grafted. So the upper part is the edible part. The lower part is the rootstock. And all these little sprouts that are coming up from below the graft, that's the rootstock variety. And this is actually flying dragon rootstock. You can tell because the little leaves are kind of a, they call it a trifoliate. It has three lobes to the leaf and it has those big thorns. Um, but these need to be removed. These, uh, they call them suckers, need to be removed if they, if they grow below the graft union because they're very vigorous and they can actually kind of outcompete the edible part of the tree. So if you see those on your citrus, just remove them. When they're really, really small, you can knock them off with your hand. And when they get a little older, you may have to prune them off. With citrus, um, they like to be watered deeply, but infrequently down to a depth of about three feet. In the orchards, they water every two weeks in summer and once a month in the winter. But when they water, they apply a lot. So if you kind if you try and duplicate that in your own yard, you may not have to, you may not be able to go quite that, you know, infrequently between waterings. But you know, try and have that be sort of your your goal. It's deeply and infrequently, <clears throat> not too often, because they need the soil to dry out just a little bit in between waterings. There's a publication on irrigating citrus. And you can find it on that on the reference sheet. There's a link to their whole uh, publication library. You can just uh, search for that. <clears throat> With fertilizing citrus, they need nitrogen the most, and um, they may or may not need the micronutrients. The time to fertilize citrus are just remember the holidays in February, May, and September. So that's Valentine's Day, Memorial Day, or Labor Day. Or if you forget Valentine's, you can fertilize now on St. Patrick's Day. That's, you know, that's close enough. But don't fertilize after September because you don't want to force growth during the cold months when those tender shoots can be damaged by the frost. The trick is to use the recommended amount, but divide it by the time, number of times you're going to apply. So if the package says a citrus tree, you know, the size of whatever you have in your yard needs, let's just say three pounds, needs three pounds of fertilizer. You don't put it all out at once. You divide it into the three times you're going to apply it. So a pound each time. And again, there's a link or you can find the fertilizing citrus publication on the U of A 
library that did the search, uh, use the search feature in their library. Here's the fertilizing chart. So in the, on the far left is the size of the tree. And then the product that you use, the numbers here, the percentages refer to the percent of nitrogen that's included in the product that you're going to use. So the organic products have a, a lot less nitrogen, so you have to use a little more of quantity. But if you look at the right, you know, like ammonium sulfate, it has 21% nitrogen. So even a mature tree doesn't need, but well, I mentioned pounds, but that one's in this chart, it says six pounds. So if you apply it three times a year, you only need two pounds each time. And that chart is available on the U of A library search page. There are a few pests that affect citrus. And one of them is so tiny, it's like, you know, almost match head, tiny size, but it causes this sort of crinkling uh, look to leaves of the citrus trees. It's totally cosmetic. It doesn't really bother the tree and it's really nothing to worry about. And they're called drips, those little insects, drips. Now, if you see this guy on your citrus, which I've lived in the valley all my life, and my I mentioned my family had citrus farms. Um, I've only seen this on a tree out in the field once. So they're kind of sneaky little guys, and it looked like a bird dropping, right? But it's actually a caterpillar, and it is the so you're looking at a baby butterfly. Caterpillars are baby butterflies. You're looking at a baby. Oh, well, they call him the orange dog caterpillar. You're looking at a baby giant swallowtail. That's what it turns into. Aren't they gorgeous? So the caterpillar might need a couple of your citrus leaves. If it's on a mature tree, you, I wouldn't worry about it. If it's on a you know, very young tree, you can pull him off and put him on a, a mature tree. If it's not in your yard, maybe it's in your neighbor's yard. And then you'll have butterflies. Citrus have a really thin bark, so they sunburn easily. And uh, if they've been pruned so that the canopy is up off the ground like this, it's okay to paint them. You don't have to use white. You can use any color latex paint, just dilute it one to one with water. And you can even color match the bark. So you can paint it you know, a brownish color if you want to. Sometimes citrus leaves look like this. And our first temptation, temptation is to do what? Yeah, oh my gosh, it must need water. That's not the case. It's got a little nutrient problem. And this is common in the wintertime. So if this is when you notice it, I wouldn't panic. A lot of times citrus drop their fruit in June. They're at the, at the, they can support so many fruit going into maturity. And so they drop the excess. So that's normal. If you see little uh, like, you know, marble sized fruits dropping off in June, that's normal. If you have dry fruit, say, uh, you know, in, uh, in the fall, you start picking your fruit and they're dry inside, it's due to insufficient watering in late summer. Remember, they need to be watered deeply, but infrequently. And if you have grapefruit with thick skin, that's usually as a result of too much fertilizer. Grapefruit only needs half the amount of recommended fertilizer. There's lots of other deciduous fruits that do really well here. These are the, the deciduous trees or the ones that or plants or the ones that lose their leaves in the winter. The deciduous fruits tend to have a short lifespan here in the desert. So peaches, plums, nectarines, they uh, don't always do that well here. Apples do better. Apples and apricots seem to live a little bit longer. They need what's called chilling hours to have a successful crop. And these are the number of hours. Once the tree loses its leaves in the fall, these are the number of the hours where the temperatures are below 45 degrees. And you can see that because of our mild winters, we don't, they, we don't accumulate a lot of chilling hours. So look for a tree that needs probably a close to around 200 chill hours to produce a good crop. 
if it needs 800, I mean, I've seen, you know, pieces sold at the home improvement stores here that need, that are, that need 800 chill hours. Look for something that only needs around 200. And there's a publication for this also. Our deciduous roots need more water, um, but because they give us a crop, you know, we can kind of justify that. Just be sure and water deeply, but infrequently. They're best pruned when they're dormant. And depending on the type of tree you have, whether it's a peach or an apple, there's a different pruning technique. And I found that if you just go on YouTube and search for, you know, let's say pruning an apple tree, look for a, a, um, a result that comes up in your search that has, or you can put it into your search that has EDU. So that's a university site. And um, I found some good ones on North Carolina. They're, State University of Site for pruning trees. It kind of gives you videos on how to do it yourself. Okay, how about landscape plants? There are some plants in your landscape that are edible, like yucca. They have these beautiful stalks of kind of creamy white flowers, which are edible. They're great in salads. Or how about this one? They're blooming right now. This is the chuparosa. They have these, uh, they don't always have leaves. They, they kind of have like, you know, stems, <laughs> naked, naked, naked stems during most of the year. But then this time of year, they, they do develop some leaves. But they have these gorgeous sort of scarlet flowers. And the hummingbirds go crazy over this plant. These flowers are edible and they taste like mild cucumber. So you can put them in your salad as well. Rosemary, this is a common landscape plant. Looks great in these uh, raised borders. And it's the same stuff you can buy at the grocery store for, you know, two bucks for a little tiny container. But if you have it in your landscape, it's the same plant. So don't, don't, don't buy it at the store anymore. There are some annual flowers that are edible. This is nasturtium. They have kind of a peppery, uh, peppery flavor. The leaves and the flowers are edible, but I think the flowers are prettier. <laughs> the leaves, almost like a watercress kind of peppery you know, flavor to it. Here it is in a salad. Even pansies. Yeah, these crazy things, they're edible too. You can put pansies in your salad. There's a salad with some pansy petals and even a little, a little daisy flower, that's a calendula. Those are edible too. In summertime, this is kind of a common weed. It's called purslane. And they have kind of fleshy leaves that grow low to the ground. There's two varieties. One has, uh, one's called horse purslane. This is the common one. This is the, the, the edible one. And uh, yeah, they're very, very good. You can um, drizzle them with some olive oil and put them in a salad. Here they are with some grilled tomatoes or even some garbanzo beans. Has a little bit of a spinach flavor. And if you plant a garden, just remember that you're going to attract some critters. Now, these are probably going to be mostly beneficial, but um, things like, of course, our caterpillars that turn into butterflies, even uh, lizards, four legged critters. So I want you to guess the bug. What is that? Well, tell me if it's a bad bug or a good bug. There's an indication by what he's got in his little pincers. Yeah, that's an aphid. So this is a good bug. And most people don't recognize the larval form of insects because they look so different. But this is that green lacewing fly. They're very delicate and they kind of flutter, flutter around your porch lights at night. Yeah, they don't eat anything. The adults don't, but the larvae eat aphids and white flies. All right, what about this guy? Do you recognize him? Of course, this is giant size. They're only like, you know, a quarter of an inch long. This is a baby ladybug. So those are good guys. If you see them in your garden, yeah, celebrate because that means that you'll have uh, ladybugs there. And again, the larvae eat way more aphids than the adult ladybugs. There's all kinds of beneficial insects hanging out around your garden. The trick is to know, you know, which ones are good. 
um, up in the top left is a little parasitic, parasitic, yeah, parasitic you know, wasp, and she is laying an egg in an aphid. So she's parasitizing the aphid. Spiders are great. These little, um, these are tiny on the left, on the right. These are tiny eggs. They're in little filaments, silvery filaments. Those are the lacewing eggs. So if you see those on the undersides of your leaves, you'll know you have those lacewing flies coming soon, the larva. Well, and here's a parasitized aphid. They call them aphid mummies. So that little, that little wasp has been at work. You might have to get a magnifying glass to take a look at some of your leaves. But all kinds of insect predators. We've got, you know, praying mantids. This is a robber fly. They catch insects. The little bug with big eyes. He's a big eyed bug. They eat aphids, spiders, they eat all kinds of things. This one, a saw pugid, you might see if you're kind of on the outskirts of town. He's not a scorpion. He eats other insects. And he doesn't sting. I wouldn't want to pick him up though. This is the assassin bug. He catches other insects. Minute pirate bug. They like white flies. And that little parasitic wasp. This time she's after a white fly. And these are the parasitized white flies. So all those guys are hanging out in your garden. If you walked out tomorrow and you saw this one, I hope before you panic, you might think what this caterpillar turns into. Remember, we told you caterpillars are baby butterflies? Well, they can also be baby moths too. And in this case, he's the stinks moth. So this is the adult. And they're great pollinators. But the hornworms are a little, you know, we don't want them in the tomatoes. So it's important to use integrated pest management. So this is a strategy using non toxic or low, low toxic. Um, control methods. So for caterpillars, here's a product that contains a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. I don't think I wrote that down, but it sometimes it's just called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, and it only targets caterpillars. So all your other garden um, beneficials are safe. It's safe for people, pets, fish, wildlife, only targets caterpillars. White flies, they love the color yellow. And if you buy these sticky white fly traps, they get stuck on there and then they can't go lay their eggs. You can also use products that, have, that contain a natural pyrethrin. This is derived from a little chrysanthemum type flower. And you can, I use that to spot spray. Diatomaceous earth is great for, for controlling crawling insects. They crawl through it and they, their little exoskeletons get cut and then they dry out. Uh, insecticidal soaps are okay, but they kill everything. So you kind of have to be careful because they kill the beneficials as well. Boric acid powder, this kills also uh, crawling insects. So it's great for things like crickets and roaches. And even oranges, you can take your leftover oranges, throw them in the blender and it creates a slurry and you can pour this down ant holes. There's a compound in the peel of oranges that is toxic to ants. Here's a product that is um, on the market. I have just a, just a minute left. I think I could squeeze this in. So this is neem. Sometimes they call it neem oil or neem. Anyhow, it comes from a tree, a tropical tree from Asia. And it uh, prevents insects from feeding in some cases. In other cases, it blocks the, um, the, mature, the maturing process of the insects, so they can't molt, and then they don't mature, so they die. It targets all these little guys at the bottom here, the aphids and caterpillars and things like that. So this, you have to spray it on. So this would be something that, uh, that would, you could try. But again, it might also kill some of the beneficials. The soaps, we talked about that. They work best on the soft body uh, insects. They, some of these soaps are what they call phytotoxic, so they're toxic to plants. So if you're going to use it, you might try it in a small, a small spot and see how, how it works for you. 
Horticulture oils, they sell them um, and they, they do work well. They, they work best on dormant plants, plants that are like dormant in the wintertime. These can also be phytotoxic and you can't use them when it gets hot. It's, uh, it, it's bad for the plant. So, um, and the bottom bullet point is you can't apply it to actively growing shoots, which is a little tricky here because a lot of our plants grow all year long. So um, that's why they recommend that you use it on dormant plants. This is the on, on your resource page. This is the online resources for the U of A Extension Office. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but that's just what it looks like. So when you get there, you know that you've arrived. But they're redoing their website. So some of these links are broken. I checked them yesterday, but uh, have patience. The seed sources, some of these are listed on your resource list and some of the gardening books are also listed there. There's, there's more available than what I gave you on the resource list, but I thought that would be a good start. And there are more references on the uh, City of Chandler and the Town of Queen Creek websites. So, Drew, did you have anything that you wanted to tell the group before we end? Usually he comes in here. And there we go. Actually, okay, there we, we go. have a couple Sorry. of questions <laughs> for you if you're, still, if you're able, Kathy. Oh, yeah. I just wanted, I know that he wanted to tell them about the survey. Oh. Yeah. So we do have a, a short survey at the very end when you do exit. Um, if you don't mind taking a minute uh, to uh, fill out that survey, it should just take, like I said, a minute, two minutes tops. Um, it'll help us uh, with you know, future or future workshops and how we conduct them. Um, but yeah, we do have some questions um, that we would like to share with you here. Okay, sure. Okay, the first one was, uh, how do we keep cats out of containers and raised planters? Oh, you know, that's a great, uh, a great question. Um, some people use like uh, like a wire netting, and this works. You can put it down on on um, you know, flat areas, and you might be able to configure it to go in your uh, containers as well. And that will keep you know for the cats from trying to dig. I have seen products on the internet that uh, just that you can lay down in your garden areas that discourage cats from trying to dig in the gardens. Can't remember what they call them, but you might just go, might just you know, do a search for um, you know cat deterrent gardens and, and see what comes up. But I know I know I had someone uh, tell me they use stems from their roses with had the thorns on them and they laid those down, which I mean I think that would work. Depends on how you feel about cats, you know, because uh, they might get their little paws stuck in the rose thorns. But yeah, they can they can if they start digging, they can do some damage. So. The, the wire works pretty well if you can lay that down, but there may be a, another solution that's uh, a little more flexible, I would hope, than trying to cut wire. Okay, thank you for that. And then it looks like we've got one more question. If you're planting three sisters style, do you have, do you have to thin it so you've got one corn stalk per mound, or do you can you have several corn stalks? Per no, mound? the idea is to to group the corn stalks. So I would plant like I don't know, maybe even six to a dozen in the mound. The mounds are pretty big because a corn need you know in the corn fields they're they're very close together and the corn is wind pollinated. So you need to have them kind of grouped together so that the so that the pollen can uh, float and attach onto the silks of the immersion corn ears. So yeah, plant a lot in the in the middle of your mound for the corn. That's a great question. All right, thank you, Kathy. It looks like that's all the questions we have. Okay, great. Well, thanks for everyone for tuning in and uh, good luck with your gardens this spring. It's It's been, uh, we've got some really nice weather. So hopefully that'll continue for a while and you can get everything planted that you want to. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for another awesome presentation. I just want to thank everyone as well for attending our workshop today. Um, hope 
Uh, we do have other workshops coming up uh, for this spring. Uh, hopefully, other uh, hopefully you can attend some of the upcoming workshops. Um, but thank you again. Hope everyone has a great rest of their week.